considered. After all things considered, you know, five or six weeks of Labour government, they haven't quite given away the stall, uh, but they've, they're trying hard. I mean, you know, 22% to junior doctors, 14% uh, to the train drivers. I don't know who's going to be next. Well, I, I'm actually much more concerned about all this business with uh, saying the wrong thing on Twitter because I'm a very active yes. uh, Twitter or X user. So, uh, I, I, you know, I'm uh, very concerned that I'll be able to knock on the door from the local constabulary taking me away for, for tweeting something, uh, I don't know, about whatever, Starmer. Yeah, Palestine, but this is the anything. trouble, isn't it? Because they don't, it's not clear. I mean, I was talking to Stephen Barrett the other, the, the other day, the lawyer, barrister, who said, you know, the government is going to have to be much more specific about what it is that they're going to lock you up for. You know, because I don't know personally, and I'm like you, I'm quite active on Twitter, you know, I don't know what it is that I'm going to say which is likely to be in breach of some kind of rule. I don't know where the boundary is, you know? And if they're going to accuse me of inciting violence, um, you know, I'd like to know exactly how... That is, you know, is, is framed. Well, there are about 20,000 anonymous bots from Iran that are tweeting stuff all day long. So I'm not quite sure how they're going to lock them up. But, right. you know, it's, it's mad. I mean, you know, we're, we're great believers in free speech in this nation, and that's uh, long may that continue. Yes, absolutely right. But as long as you've got the Metropolitan Police, which we learned this morning is not fit for purpose pretty much in any area that it's supposed to be, uh, has the guy running it called Sir Mark Rowley, who thinks he's going to head over to America and start arresting people for posting tweets from the other side of the Atlantic. Yeah, uh, I don't know. They're, they're living on a completely different planet. And it's, it's a very dangerous, uh, dangerous journey. Uh, that we're heading on if they do continue with, with all this stuff. Yeah. You know, you, you, you don't defeat an argument by shutting it up. Right. You, you, you know, you have, to, uh, you have to listen to it and, and destroy it with yeah. common sense, convince people. That's how, you know, that's, that's how we work for the last, uh, last hundreds of years, and that's yeah. how things should continue. Well, it's called democracy, isn't it? And then every yeah, now exactly. and again, you get a chance to vote for something and somebody that you might like or might dislike. And that's well, that's right. But, but you know, I, I think you know, perhaps the start of this all going wrong was with the uh, the, the Brexit referendum. You know, we, you want to talk about referenda, but yeah. you know, we had the referendum. But did people actually get what they thought they were voting for? No, they didn't. Because uh, you know, yes, we have Brexited uh, uh, the EU in name, but have we actually sought uh, any of the or taken any of the potential advantages that we could have done? Absolutely not. We've done nothing with it. No, exactly right. And it was in the end, it was all a bit of a fudge, wasn't it? I mean, it was typical sort of Boris Johnson production. It was like, well, just tell everybody we've we've uh, we've got Brexit done, and they'll all believe it. But in fact, well, like, Brexit suppose, didn't really get done, he, did it? Yeah, he sort of did fudge it. But I think the the, the bigger fudge though was Theresa May. Mm. And I think what went wrong was that you know the, the country had been divided for many years. You know, there were you know half the population thought we should be in the EU, half thought we should leave. And the idea of the referendum was to sort of, you know, draw a line under this and to say, look, we can't just completely, you know, be divided forever. We have to make a decision as to which way we're going. We'll have the referendum and that will decide. And we had it. And the vote went in favour of leaving. And rather than Theresa May saying, right, now we're going to leave and do everything mm. we need to do to get out. She said, right, we've had the referendum. Now we need to bring everyone back together again. And so you end up with that same battle that just continues and, uh, it, you know, continues today. And that's why, you know, I mean, Richard Ty says, let's have a referendum on, uh, on um, immigration. You know, I, it's the same thing. Unless, you, unless you're actually going to act on the result, what is the point? Yeah. Um, the, the, the only, the only uh, advantage I can possibly see here would be that... Uh, if, if we announced uh, we were going to stop all immigration until the referendum is done and, and we, we agreed to have the referendum in 10 to 15 years, well, maybe we'll be able to control it for 10 to 15 years in the meantime. Yes. But, uh, you know, uh, seriously, I, I don't think that's the answer. All the political parties or all the main political parties in the last election said that they wanted to control immigration. But the reality is... None of them are doing anything no. about it. Well, I mean, it's A-level it's it's day today, and, and I, your kids are probably older than, uh, the, than mine, and so you're probably through that already. But I was talking to um, a vice-chancellor at a university up in Leicester who said today that, you know, a lot of universities are struggling because foreign students are not coming in as large numbers because now we've limited who they can bring with them. I mean, I don't know who came up with that idea, but the idea uh, that if you come here as a student, you can bring sort of five or six members of your family, it was completely insane. 
And, you know, the idea that then, then somehow 1.2 million people came here every year as a result of that, many of them to study, but many of them just to be with them so that they could live here, was ridiculous. But it was ridiculous. It was an excuse to get into the country. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't right. about uh, uh, genuine studies, in, in, in my, my opinion. You know, in, in principle, Mike, I'm not anti-immigration. I come from a family of immigrants. My yeah. dad was a Holocaust survivor and Britain offered offered him refuge. Mm. The same with my great grandfather on my mum's side, you know, back in the, the 1900s. I'm not anti-immigration. But uh, but back then, they weren't given everything. They weren't given pocket money. They weren't given homes to live mm. in. They weren't given free health and education. They are given everything today. And it is completely, un first of all, that is a, a massive unfairness on, you know, Brits here that are struggling and struggling to get on the housing ladder and so on. Yeah. Uh, but but also, I think there, there, there is a big difference. Uh, and, and I think that the thing that really concerns people today is the... Um, the lack of shared values. You know, the people that are coming here aren't looking to integrate into British society. And I th think that is where the underlying problem is. Right. And I don't think it's about culture. I think it's about values. You know, people here aren't necessarily sharing our values. Is it not uh, the same and, thing um, in a way, though? Because in the, in the end, you've also got people who are coming here who don't regard themselves as British. You know, uh, I had a guy driving uh, me the other day and he said, oh, I'm going home... Um, shortly you know going for a holiday I haven't been for a long time and i mean i can understand why you would call it home and it turned out he was from somalia right and he just went yeah i'm, I'm going home but i was i mean I, I was always struck when i lived in america of how no matter what country people came from when they lived in new york they were american they didn't call anywhere else home they were like america is my home now i'm american um yeah well that's absolutely right and certainly i know again coming back to to sort of my own family and my own sort of culture and religion uh, you know in judaism you know what, one of the things we do every single week in, in every single synagogue in the land is we say a prayer for the royal family mm. you know we're very proud of being british very proud that you know uh, as jewish people we, we've been welcomed into this country although we're finding it a little bit uh difficult right now yeah. uh, but i you know Hindus, again, you, you just don't get this sort of cultural problem. They integrate well, but they still maintain their cultures and their sort of festivals and so on. But there are certain communities, which I think we, we both know, uh, you know what we're talking about here, yeah. that, that aren't, just, aren't interested in integrating and aren't interested in sort of uh, becoming part of Britain. And I'm not saying that's throughout the entire community, but certain elements of it, and, and th th that is problematic. Yeah, absolutely right. Now, I know we haven't got a load of time, but you've got something interesting to tell us about um, a performance that's coming up, uh, a play that you wrote 37 years ago, um, which is now going to be performed uh, by your daughter, I think. Yeah, this is uh, this is very exciting, uh, Mike, um, and nothing to do with the referendum, of course, but I appreciate you uh, allowing me to mention it. Yeah, th 37 years ago, or 40 years ago, I, I was president of the Cambridge Union Society, which is, is usually a sort of launch pad for a political career. And uh, I had this uh, extraordinary battle to become president against a completely different sort of character. And uh, I wrote a play about it um, soon after leaving university. And the play almost got produced by a quite a well-known uh, film producer, actually, a guy called Harry Saltzman mm. of the James Bond, you know, Saltzman and yes. Broccoli, the James Bond producers. And uh, But it never happened. And it just sat on a shelf. And it just sat on a shelf for literally those 40 years. And my daughter picked it up earlier this year. She's a, a drama graduate from NYU in the US. And she said, oh, Dad, I didn't realise you'd written this play. Can I read it? And she read it, loved it, asked if she could produce it. And it's on at the Edinburgh Fringe next week. She's performing in it too. Um, and uh, it's very exciting. It's about this battle, these two characters that are fighting each other for this you know, prestigious position. And at the end of the second act, there's there's the audience actually get to vote. There's a real election, the audience votes, and there are two completely different endings, depending on which way they vote. And uh, we're really, I mean, I've been watching the rehearsals and the dress rehearsals, first dress rehearsal yesterday, really excited about it. It's a great play, this side of the house. If anyone's in Edinburgh next week, please do go and have a watch, this side of the house. Right. M many, many, you know, many former sort of cabinet ministers, Prime Ministers have become presidents of either the Oxford or the Cambridge Union. So it, it is a sort of launch pad right. for a political career. And you said as well there's a bit of, a, of, of an immigration theme in it somewhere as well. Well, there's, it was, it, it, and, you know, not having seen, not having 
you know, seeing it for about 40 years and watching the uh, the play come back to life. It's just extraordinary how some of the issues back then are re relevant today. You know, there were riots going on back then. There were lots of discussions about racism. Apartheid was still, you know, in play at that time. And some of those issues are, are sort of covered um and you know and they sort of seem quite relevant uh, to today um the the script has not been altered um so it is completely politically incorrect so there's content warnings that come with it <laughs> you know there's sexism and racism and uh you know I, i'm not sure if the sort of uh, younger viewers younger audience are going to find this particularly comfortable but uh you know they should know what it was like being a student back in the 1980s mm, interesting stuff Lance